Seven-year-old Kyron Horman has been missing from a most unlikely place, his elementary school in Portland, Oregon. Since then, the investigation has focused on a most unlikely person, Kyron's own stepmother. Everybody's in shock that this could happen in our little school that we all, everybody knows everybody. Any small tidbit of information, where did he go, how come no one knows where he is? I don't care if they ask you to take 10 polygraphs, you've got to do it. What's going on in the Horman home? He's only seven, a bit shy, awkward even kind of little guy who's just starting to discover his world. He's the kind of son that every father hopes they're going to have. He's a great kid. He's got a great smile. Everybody has become familiar with it. Dad saw him, you know, uh, with his stepmom and, and looking at his exhibit and just like the other families who were here. Terry Horman said around 8.45 in the morning, the last time she saw her stepson, Kyron, he was walking down this hallway in his school on his way to his second grade classroom. Did you know something was wrong right then or did you think, well, maybe he's just back at school expecting me to pick him up. That's what I had thought originally. So I just thought, well, it's a mistake. We'll go get him. Said he hadn't been at school all day. And that's when the panic started to set in. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Today's episode, Marked Absent, the Kyron Horman case. Now, Kyron Horman, he was born on September 9th of 2002. On June 4th of 2010, at the age of seven, he was reported missing when he did not return home from school. He went to the Skyline Elementary School in Portland, Oregon. Now, Kyron's dad, his stepmom, and his little sister, they went to meet him at the school bus that afternoon. But the bus driver told them that Kyron had never boarded the bus. When the driver called the school, the secretary said that Kyron had not been in school since early that morning. He had been marked absent. This was the beginning of a living hell for those who love Chiron. After exhaustive search and rescue efforts, the sheriff's office announced that the search for Chiron had shifted to a criminal investigation, and despite continued efforts over the past six years, Chiron's whereabouts are still unknown. No trace of Chiron. Not a trace. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do a couple five-star reviews because we haven't done that in a while, and then you can do your beer review. Sounds good to me. Okay. So the first five-star review is from Abby0012, and she says, Great show. Interesting perspective on the cases, intelligent questions, and inquiry. They remind me of the Sweaty Balls skit on SNL. It's not the first time that we've heard that, right? Have we been compared to that before? We have, yes. Well, Maybe I didn't tell you. I didn't want to upset you. That's an honor. <laughs> no, I think that's great. It's a great skit, yeah. It is. So <laughs> if we can be mentioned in the same breath as that, I think we've done it. I think so. It's a classic. So Abby says, they remind me of the sweaty balls. Sweaty. I think it's Sh- sweaty. Sweaty balls. Thank you. Skit on SNL, but it's endearing. Abby, 0012, welcome to the brewery. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> And then one more is from user MMH. And user MMH says, Awesome podcast. You guys have combined two of my favorite things, true crime and beer. As a New Englander living in Chicago, your accents remind me of home. I didn't think we had much of a main accent. Yeah. Don't you know? (laughs) You got a wicked accent. Wicked pissa accent. (laughs) So, user MMH, welcome to the brewery. Thank you. So that's all I've got. Let's hear the beer review, the most important part of the show. Well, no, I I wouldn't say that. (laughs) I'm going to be modest. It's the highlight for many. But what we're going to do is a a beer from Oregon, obviously, because it's an Oregon crime. This is Obsidian Stout from Deschutes Brewery in Bend, Oregon. Now, Obsidian Stout is an American stout which is kind of an amalgamation of English stouts and Irish stouts. The American version tends to be more highly hopped. Uh, There can be coffee or chocolate added, and sometimes they're even barrel-aged in bourbon or whiskey barrels. Despite being more highly hopped, they tend to be more balanced in hops, and usually only 4 to 7 percent, unlike the double stouts or imperial stouts that tend to be upwards of 10 percent. So, this beer is served in a pint glass. Oh. Faked you out. You did. It's a very dark black beer. Okay. Impermeable to light. 
Mm. So and I, I went in just to look up, because I wasn't aware of what obsidian was. I'm and, not either. And Fill it me turn, in. turns out that obsidian is a dark volcanic glass-like rock. Oh, so okay. So when, when the volcano erupts, this is one of the results of the eruption. That's a cool name. I like that. So I think it being very black and light resistant or light repellent sounds good. Small tan head to it, not much in the way of lacing. Kind of a burnt coffee and chocolate aroma. Well, it seems like most stouts have that, if yeah, I'm catching I, on at all. That's true. I think this one is a little bit more in the burnt side. Tastes like espresso, very strong coffee, burnt coffee. And there's a little bit of chocolate. There's some sweetness to it. But I think the predominant taste is uh, the char. It's a pretty smooth beer, very easy to drink. And the alcohol by volume is low enough that you can put back a few. All right. So I recommend it. Okay. Excellent review. Thanks, Dickie. All right. Let's slide down to the quiet end of the bar. We'll take our pint glasses and have a heartfelt discussion on the missing boy, Kyron Horman, who was marked absent from school over six years ago and hasn't been seen since. No trace of Kyron. No. Interesting story. Now, as I said in the introduction, it was June 4th, 2010, when Kyron was brought to school by his stepmother, Terry Horman, and... She visited the science fair with Kyron, who was very proud of his project. It was on the red-eyed tree frog. So Kyron was kind of a little character, super cute, his little spectacles, and he was really into science from what his dad said. So what have we got for info on Kyron, who he was as a person? I'd like to share that. Well, yeah, this, this sounds like a cool little kid. And, it and does. It's, this is stuff that comes from his dad, and I think some from the birth mother, too, his mother. Yeah, Desiree. But he liked Hot Wheels. Yeah. Yeah. Legos. Nintendo Wii. Then he liked to go camping, fishing, and boating. I mean, that's not typical stuff for a seven-year-old. No, not necessarily. I mean, well, the Legos and stuff are... Hot Wheels, Legos, and Nintendo, sure. Absolutely. But, but the uh, being outdoorsy, not as much. He was interested in math and science. Now, again, it's a seven-year-old. Yeah, I wonder if his father kind of got him into that. His father was an engineer, so maybe he was into that kind of stuff. That could be. He seemed like a pretty happy kid. I think both parents mentioned that if you look at all the pictures they have of him, he's pretty much always smiling. Yeah, yeah. And he was apparently a very intelligent kid. And he had two movies that he loved. Yeah. Toy Story. That's one of my favorites. The original, not the sequels. I liked Although all three. the sequels were pretty good. I thought good. all three were excellent. And Iron Man, also the original. Okay. Is that the one with Robert Downey Jr.? Yes. Okay. I aren't, have never seen those. Aren't they all? I don't know. I've never seen them. I think he's always Iron Man. Okay. But anyway. I'm not a big superhero person. Favorite foods. All right. Mac and cheese. Kids yeah. love mac and cheese. I got give away from that. Yeah. Pizza, another biggie. But then here's a curveball. He likes sushi. Yeah, I thought so, that makes him pretty cool. So how many seven-year-old boys like sushi? Not too many, Not I would think. Not that many, no. No, but Benji does, right? Benji, the grandson. Yes, he likes sushi. He does. Yeah, and he's ten, but he's but liked sushi since he was younger. He's kind of off-center anyway. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't call it off-center. I would call it, I don't know, esoteric? Eccentric. Eccentric. Okay. Okay. But it's cool to think of these things. Make him a person before we get into this, right? Yeah, no, he's an individual. He, he he's definitely sounds like an individual. Absolutely. So according to Terry, she left the school that morning around 8.45 a.m. And she says she remembers seeing Kyron walking down the hall toward his classroom. But Kyron was never seen in his class that morning. So Terry told police that after leaving the school at 8.45, she ran errands until about 10.10 10 a.m. So that's very specific. That is. Mm -hmm. Now, the the first question I would have, because we're going to see that I think she's 
going to claim that there's a stranger abduction or that he is abducted. She's going to suggest that for sure. Yeah. So he's walking down the hallway in the school. Yeah, like within a hundred feet of his class, very very yeah. close to being so in his class. How does he get snatched right in the school? Well, that's what makes it very hard to believe because if they were if they were away from the school, if they were outside, you could kind of see it a little sure. bit more. But, but yeah, he's right in there. And she said they were in the school because they're at the science fair. Mm -hmm. And she walked him and left him walking down the hallway to his classroom. That's what she said, yeah. That's what she said. Right. So I don't see how he could be abducted from there. So well, I'm already thinking that she never set him off to school or to his classroom. Well, to be fair, there were a lot of people there going from classroom to classroom looking at projects. So there could have been someone there. I suppose there Bad could have been. Bad intentions. There could have been. Then this little seven-year-old wouldn't have made a commotion if somebody snatched him. Right. That's that's unusual. Well, anyway. It would be highly irregular. Proceed. Okay. I just wanted to get my two cents in at the start. Absolutely. So it was between 10.10 10 a.m. and 11.39 a.m. Terry said that she drove her daughter around town to soothe her. Now, her daughter was a toddler, and she was suffering from an earache. Terry arrived at her local gym, where she liked to work out, at 11.39 a.m. Now, she put the toddler in the on-site daycare, and she worked out, according to her, until 12.40 p.m. She went home. She posted photos of Kyron at his science fair on Facebook from the home computer at 1.21 p.m. Now, it was at 3.30 p.m. that Terry Horman, her husband Kane Horman, and their toddler daughter Kiara walked to the school bus stop to meet Kyron. But Kyron wasn't on the bus, and the driver called the school, and that's when the family learned that he had been absent from school all day. The school secretary immediately called 911 to report Kyron missing, and the family met the police at Kyron's school at that point. So things happened pretty quickly. Yeah. Once, once, once it was, it was recognized out. recognized that right. he wasn't there. Right. Now, of so course, it's been several hours by then. It has been. Though I, I have a couple of things here, too. Yeah. You know, if you've got a sick kid, the, the infant with a possible ear infection, mm -hmm. why do you go to your gym and leave her in the gym daycare? Well, yeah. That's but a little odd. That doesn't work. Well, it doesn't make her a murderer, but it seems like a selfish no, thing to but, do. you know, you got a sick kid. Go home. Mm-hmm. And the the other thing is that she, at one of the Fred Meyer stores, I don't know which one offhand, uh, but she ran into an acquaintance, Terry ran into an acquaintance of hers named Andrea Leckie. Okay. And Terry takes the time to show her the pictures on her phone of Kyron and his project. Andrea later remarks that that was unusual because she wasn't that friendly with Terry. So they... The idea I get is that she's looking for someone to alibi her. You could certainly think that's possible, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. That she's trying to make sure that someone remembers seeing her there. Yeah. Yeah. And then she went to another Fred Meyers store. I don't know if it was the first Fred Meyers or the second Fred Meyers that she yeah. saw this Andrea Leckie. I think she saw Andrea at the second one. But she, she went to two. Yeah, she did. And, and she drove around. For a while, right? Yes, she, she did. Because she was trying to soothe or calm the little baby. That's what she said. She said she stopped and kind of rocked her. And then once she was asleep, she put her in the car seat and drove around. The thing is, the places where she said she drove around are not the places where the cell phone was pinging right. at that time. And it, it still gets me to thinking, if you've got a kid that, that is that cranky, that you're trying to drive around and soothe her, the the motion of the car and everything calms her down. Why then do you stop at your gym and work out and pop mm. her into the gym daycare? It seems like a selfish thing to do, but she was a bodybuilder before she had this baby. Well, yeah. So maybe working out was just a necessary thing. It was so, just something she did every day no matter what. Okay. It's possible. M maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm not buying it. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> you don't have to buy it. <laughs> so Gina Zimmerman, the PTA president, she said that she saw Kyron and his stepmother at the science fair at 8.15 a.m. 
and a student reported that she saw Chiron near the south entrance of the school at 9 a.m., and that was the last reported sighting of Chiron. So it's hard to describe without a visual, but the way that the school was is there were actually three or four different entrances and exits. And there was one side, which is the south entrance, that was the opposite of the front of the school. So people coming and going in the front of the school wouldn't be able to see that, what's going on there. And that is where some witnesses said they saw the white truck. At and that, that is where this student said she saw Chiron at 9 a.m. At but, that entrance. At that entrance. Okay. So that's something just to keep in mind. So just a little history here. Chiron's biological parents, Desiree Young and Kane, they separated very early in Chiron's life. They were pretty much broken up when Chiron was born, but they stayed together to have him together. Now, according to Desiree, Kane was unfaithful, and he began a relationship with Terry when Desiree was eight months pregnant with Chiron. Now, Kane says that isn't true. Well, of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to sound like a complete shit. Right. So he's just a half shit because okay. he, he waited till the baby was born and then started carrying on with Terry. Yeah. Which doesn't ring true. No, but regardless. 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 That's that's the way they they were broken up right away. Yeah. It, they, they didn't last long after the baby was born. Yeah. No, not at all. Now, Chiron lived with Desiree for the first two years of his life. Cain lived nearby with Terry. But in 2004, Desiree became very ill. She had kidney failure, and she, for some reason she went to Canada for treatment. So I don't know if it was the expense or what, but for some reason she felt that she needed to go to Canada for her treatment. And it was agreed at that time that Chiron would be better off living with Kane and Terry. So that was decided amongst them. It was agreed upon. Yeah, no, I think the reason to go to Canada was financial. You think so? Sure. Even if you have insurance or yeah yeah okay because they can still do things cheaper okay than, than the u.s and certainly not for alternative cures or anything like that they practice the same type of western medicine in canada that we do yeah i think it was so, real medicine so it wasn't for some weird cure or anything she she was going there i'm sure for strictly financial reasons okay that makes sense because she doesn't seem like she was well off necessarily right no, no. I mean, she's divorced and single at the time right yeah and she had an older son as well from another marriage yeah from another or marriage. another relationship well another relationship i don't know if she was married okay. but she did have another ch a child before she had chiron with cain okay an older child so desiree remarried eventually to tony young and he was a former policeman and they lived about four and a half hours south of cain and terry so Cain continued to have primary custody of Chiron, and Terry was actively involved in parenting Chiron. A lot of people felt like she was his mother. People didn't really think she was the stepmother unless they knew. They found her to be very involved in parenting him. Right. And she didn't discourage the idea. I don't think that so. That she was the stepmother. No, you know, I don't think so. That she was the mother. Oh, of people thinking that. Yeah. Not that I know I, of. I think... We've, we've seen interviews with her where she said that Chiron called her mom, and, yeah. he, and he called Desiree Medford mom. I don't know if that's true, but it would make sense if she's raising him. Yeah. Yeah. But so, he did visit his mother often, and... Yeah, I, I think she was pretty involved in his upbringing once her well, kidney disease got taken care of. It seems that way, but she did trust Terry with his day-to-day -day care. Well, yeah, he yeah. lived up there. Right. So when Chiron went missing, at first the two couples, they stood together in the search for this little boy, trying to comfort each other. But that changed as soon as the police began questioning the family members because Terry Horman failed two polygraph tests and then she refused to be interviewed anymore. Right. And so, every, everybody else passed their polygraph tests. Yes. Now the thing that Desiree's husband, Tony, <laughs> had said is that Terry seemed very hesitant to do the polygraph at all. Right. She walked out of the first one, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and then she came back and took it, and she failed. And she, with the first failure, she said that it was due to her being deaf in one ear. Now, she, she claimed that her back was to the polygraph guy, 
and she couldn't, she has to read lips. I don't know how true that is. Well, she claims that she's deaf in one ear. Yeah. So you have one functioning ear. You can still hear. <laughs> yes, I would think so. And why would you fail? You just ask what a lot, I would guess. Right. You know, you, you just say, make him repeat himself. I, I didn't hear the question. So I, I, I have no information that says that that is a reason why someone would fail a polygraph. None whatsoever. No. She also said, I don't know, it must not be the first one, because she said he had, she had her back to him. Mm -hmm. But she said she was trying to read his lips. Well, she said she failed because she couldn't read his lips right. because he was behind her. Oh, that's, that's what I think she said. That's just ridiculous. Of course what? she can't read his lips. He's standing behind her. <laughs> I know. And she that's got, what she, she said the problem was. <laughs> she doesn't have eyes in the back of her head. Not that I know I, of. I just figured that she failed the second one because she was facing the polygraph administrator <laughs> and was trying to read lips, which is still bullshit to me because you got an ear that can hear perfectly well. Well, I think in the second one she actually said that she hadn't had any sleep that she was stressed uh -huh. out, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is, that also has never been shown to affect a polygraph that I know of. No. No. So, take it as you will. I take it as failing two polygraph tests. So it's a bad sign for her. It's not good. No. And police soon found out that Terry had actually attempted to hire their landscaper to kill her husband, Kane. So this was a shocker, much, probably more than failing the polygraph. <laughs> I would say. And Kane had been supporting her in the beginning, but this pushed him over the edge. This was the end of their marriage. Understandably. Yeah. I mean, he's he's starting to think that she might be involved in the disappearance of their son. Yeah. And then he finds out she was probably trying to get a hitman to kill him. Yeah, and I would think at that point you'd be convinced that something is wrong here. Well, yeah. Yeah, it was five months before Kyron went missing that this happened, but the landscaper didn't say anything until he was questioned after Kyron's disappearance. So he hadn't gone to the police at the beginning? No, or I think he just he turned her down. Maybe he didn't think she was serious or something. I don't know. He, he just... might not have. I don't know. Yeah. But, but this came up after Kyron's disappearance, and they were questioning people that know the family. Right, right. And So I'm sure the landscaper was interviewed as being... A person that yeah. knew Chiron. Sure. Right. And also, another thing was that searches of her cell phone and her email account showed that she had been sexting and exchanging nude photos with a former friend of Kane. Oh, Jesus. Which was, I think most of it was done after Chiron disappeared, which is just as bad as beforehand because she should be thinking about the boy, it, I would it think. It might be worse. She shouldn't really be in the mood for sexting. No. No. And I could see how someone might go to the arms of someone for comfort. I could almost see that. But the sexting and the nude photos well, is suspicious to me. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's some shades here. Right. And there's one thing to be looking for comfort, and the other is to be aggressively sexting. Correct. This guy. Well, her behavior who's, was odd because... Who's a friend of the husband, right? Well, a former friend. I don't know former how friend. if they were still friends at that point. It was someone who went to high school with Kane. Okay. And a lot of her emails were strange. Besides the nude photos, she wrote some emails that were just odd. They were just chipper and not mentioning that Kyron was missing. I think she had posted on Facebook, um, I'm going to hit the gym now, like a day or two afterwards, as if it was any other day. And this just turned people off to her, and people questioned, what's going on with this lady? Obviously, it didn't seem like the kind of behavior you would expect from a mother whose child is missing. And from what we said, she was like a mother to him. So why is she well, not acting? she says she was a mother to him. Well, yes, but she did do a lot for him. She did well, care for yeah, him. Yeah, she did. Yeah. But I wasn't hearing anybody else thinking that she was a mother to him. She was a stepmom. Yeah, but she took care of him. Well, yeah, kind of had to. She was living with his father. I suppose. But still, I think we should give her credit for that at least. Because okay. we don't know what was going on in the home. I'm okay. trying to be a little objective here. Yeah, I'm very slanted. I'm you sorry. <laughs> well, that's why I'm evening you out by leaning that way a little okay. bit. Okay, you lean the other way. 
well, I can't totally lean the other way. I just can't do it. But I'm going to try and give her a fair shake when I think it's necessary. Good. Yeah. So there's some other stuff here. Kyron's teacher said that Terry had led her to believe that Kyron had a doctor's appointment on the day he disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Now, if he did, why do you leave him walking down the hall to attend class, going to the doctor? Or was it a later appointment? I think that... I think that she had no intention of taking him to the doctor. There was no doctor appointment. She she was just trying to set that up. And then she said, no, it wasn't for that day he disappeared. It was for a few days later. Well, that turns out that school was done. So why do you even mention that to the teacher? Well, what she had told the teacher was, Kyron has a doctor's appointment on Friday. And this was on Tuesday or Wednesday of the week. Now, the day he disappeared, the 4th, was a Friday. Right. So I think the teacher assumed when she said that, that she meant that Friday. Sure. But then Terry said, no, she meant the next Friday. But there's a big problem with that. Yeah, because school is done. Right. So why do you even mention it? You wouldn't. No. I. You wouldn't. So a lot of people think that she was purposely trying to mislead the teacher so that alarms wouldn't go off right away and she'd have more time to do whatever she was planning to do. Possibly. So that's another thing to consider. And then the the other thing is that she borrowed Kane's truck. He had a big white pickup truck. That's right. And it was supposedly to bring home Kyron's project. That's what she said. But it didn't. And the project <laughs> stayed at school. She didn't bring the ca- the project back. And, and she didn't bring the project there either. It had been set up the day before. Right. And the other thing, when you look at the project, it's like a triple paperboard thing. Yeah, it doesn't look huge. So it's not huge. There's, you don't need a pickup truck to lug that around. You can throw it in the trunk of your car. Yeah, so that's a little weird. That's these a little weird, weird. These are just circumstantial things that are kind of just little popping things. up. Yeah. Well, I think the, the murder for hire thing was a little more than a little thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can see from Kane's point of view, he's supportive of his wife at first. Of course, And yeah. then he's starting to think, you know, she's failed polygraph tests and things. She's acting weird. She's acting weird. She's elements. saying they're making me feel guilty. I feel like right. a suspect. Elements of her story don't yeah. sound true. Correct. And then he finds out somehow, I guess the police told him, Yeah. that she was trying to hire somebody to kill him. They did, yes. It was the police. So he says that's it. He moved out of the home. He took his their daughter with him. He did. Yep. He pursued and received a restraining order against her on the basis of the murder for hire plot and his belief at that point, anyway, that Terry was involved in Kyron's disappearance. That's right. Yep. So, a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah. There's a lot to it. Now, I just want to say that Terry's never been identified as a suspect in his disappearance. In the hours after Kyron vanished, Terry wrote emails which focused on turning suspicions away from her, and they didn't really focus on finding Kyron or her concerns in that direction. No, they were trying to give her an alibi. Yeah. Right? Defending herself, basically. And the other thing, I I will probably bring this up at some point Mm -hmm. soon, (laughs) that when they were putting out flyers, they had the white pickup truck and her picture. Yeah, that was different. Yeah. That was very different. So you're you're looking for this kid, and she's on the same page. Yeah. Has that? So you know, it's like, have you seen this kid or this truck or this woman? Right. Which really makes you think that she had something to do with it. Or at least they're thinking she does. Well, yeah, I would think so. Absolutely. And there were also several people at the school who supported Kyron's teacher's claim that Terry said Kyron had a doctor's appointment. So she'd said that to more than one teacher that he had a doctor's appointment that day. That day, not the following Friday. Not the following Friday. Yeah. Which seems very a very clear misdirecting that she's doing that. And it was in late June, just a couple of weeks after Kyron disappeared, when Kane first learned that Terry had tried to hire their landscaper to kill him. Now the landscaper, Rodolfo Sanchez, said in a deposition that Terry approached him and offered him a lot of money to kill her husband, and that was about five months before Kyron's disappearance. How so, much is a lot of money? 
Well, she didn't specify, he didn't specify, but there was a point where Rodolfo Sanchez told police that Terry Horman told him that if he killed Kane, Kane would have $10,000 on him. He always did, plus a laptop, and he was free to take those things with him. So she wasn't really offering him money from her. She was just saying, you kill him and you can have that stuff. Holy cow. <laughs> so, so Cain walked around with $10,000 in his pocket all the time? I don't think that's true. No. No, I think she just told the guy that. So investigators convinced this landscaper to confront Terry while wearing a wire, but they weren't able to get any evidence that way. She shut down when he tried to talk to her. So she wasn't arrested for that. Although on June 28th, Cain filed for divorce and a restraining order, as you said, against Terry. And the divorce was granted, and he got custody of their daughter, Kiara, as well. So he disappeared June 4th? Yes. And 24 days later? He filed for divorce. He filed for divorce. Yeah, it all happened pretty quickly. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, happened quickly. So the fact that she has this young child, I just wonder about her state of mind. Was this something that she'd been planning after she had her child, did that change things? I don't know. It just seems weird. Well, I mean, everybody knows that you can have depressive symptoms postpartum. Right. But sometimes it's deeper than that, and you can have a postpartum psychosis. Yeah. Which would lead you to do things, possibly. Yeah, so some people who did have postpartum psychosis was Andrea Yates, the right. one who drowned her the five children. The woman who drowned five children. That was postpartum psychosis. Right. Yeah, so... And there's yeah, there's several So horrible things years. can happen as a result of that. Yes. Postpartum psychosis is kind of a group of mental illnesses with a sudden onset of psychotic symptoms after birth. The highest incidence is kind of in the first month or so, but it can be the first year to year and a half that symptoms can arise. Okay. So this was a little over a year and a half. Right. Yeah. The symptoms can be those of euphoria, violence, delusions, hallucinations. So all those could play in. Sure. They're not always obvious. Could that explain her acting out, her talking to the landscaper, her sexting with someone? Sure. That could, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. But symptoms generally come at a time when there's a lot of disruption in the family. you got a newborn and there's lots of new things going on. Yeah. They can come and go. So there might be good days and bad days. Okay. And then the woman who's experiencing them can try to hide them. Yeah. I was no. thinking if she was experiencing that, she may have been one of the people, one of those type of people who hides it. Right. Yeah. And I'll just throw in one other thing. I mean, a lot of times there's already some underlying psychiatric disorder okay. that can trigger the psychotic episodes. Okay. And maybe I'll get in trouble for this, but <laughs> she was a bodybuilder. Yes. And the pictures I've seen is a woman who's really buff. Absolutely. So I'm thinking she probably took steroids. Okay. And that can certainly affect your mental state. So she could have been on steroids. She was working out. She might have been trying to get back to her former body. Possibly. I mean, the, the comparison or the pictures, like before and after, there, there's absolutely no comparison. And yeah. Well, she looked kind of chubby at the time of Hiram's disappearance. Right. So that could have added to her depression. Sure. I mean, I think there's a lot of things I mean, that could contribute to it. Right. And she, she might have just been a bad person to begin with. Okay. The other thing, maybe, here's here's something far out. Okay. <laughs> you know, she approached the landscaper to murder her husband. Okay. And that didn't turn out, so maybe she decided, well, if I can't murder the my husband, I'll murder his son. To get back at him? You think it was an anger yeah, thing? I think it could have been. Could have been. Now, this is all it's pure awful. speculation. Of course. And I'm sure I'll get jumped on for this. No, I think that... That's pretty reasonable. But I, I do think, obviously, she has some mental issues. Yeah. Because anybody that murders somebody else, in my mind, has to have something. But we don't know her. that she murdered anyone. No. No. We don't. She was allegedly trying to murder her husband. Allegedly. And, and the only person who said that is this landscaper. And what do we know about him? Yeah, but why would he 
What's he got to do by lying? What's that going to get him? I don't know. You never know about people. Uh, unless he's decided, well, she must be guilty, so I'm going to say this to fuck her up some more. Possibly. You never know what but goes on in the hearts and minds of men. No, people, not people. just men. <laughs> That's right. But it's an interesting thing. Yeah, it definitely so, is. Well, I'm firmly in the camp that believes she had a hand in his disappearance. Okay. There was some speculation by Kane and others, who I can't name, I can't think of who they were, that she may have had an alcohol problem. No, she did have well, a DUI. she had a DUI. She had a DUI, which was like five years before that. So that doesn't necessarily make her an alcoholic. But she did have her child in the car at that time, her older son. Right. She had a son who was quite a bit older, and he actually was sent to go live with his father not that long before this, within the past year at least, of when Chiron disappeared. So he was living with He was living her with them. And yes. And the thought there was that he wasn't getting along with Cain, so she sent him to live with, with his father, her ex. Yeah. Right. So she may have been angry about that, that her son couldn't live there, but she was taking care of Cain's son. Yeah. And then when her daughter came along, she might have thought, you know, I just want to focus on my daughter. Who knows? Yeah, it's just a thought. That's good speculation. Yeah, I thought so. I like that. But, yeah, I mean... Whether she had an alcohol problem or not, I don't think alcohol is going to make you homicidal. No, but it could be a sign of self-medicating a mental sure. problem. Yeah. Yeah. Also interesting is that on June 1st of 2012, Chiron's mother, Desiree Young, filed a lawsuit against Terry Horman, claiming that she is responsible for the disappearance of Chiron. Now, this was a civil lawsuit, of course, and it was an attempt to prove that Terry kidnapped Tyron or did something to him. And Desiree Young sought $10 million in damages in this lawsuit. And then in August of 2012, a motion by Terry to delay this lawsuit was denied by the judge. But then, as it turned out, in July of 2013, Desiree dropped the lawsuit. and She stated that she doesn't want to jeopardize the police investigation. So I don't know if the police approached her and asked her to do that? I'm not sure. But well, I would say so. Sounds like it. Yeah. So her statement to the press read, Because my civil case can't go forward without the police criminal investigation file, it is with great disappointment I make this difficult decision to withdraw. Yeah. So that I mean, was the end of that. Desiree has a real hard on for Terry. I mean, she, she's <laughs> convinced. She is, right. and I think there are things they know that they haven't shared. Right. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. Yeah. The police are trying to keep some things quiet, which is probably wise. It but is. Of mean, course she's angry. Yeah. This woman may have done away with her son. I'm sure she's livid. Definitely. Now, the thing is, with a civil suit, she should probably wait until something criminal was to happen and then do it like... And um, then file it. Yeah, yeah. like with the O.J. Simpsons. Sure. The Goldmans. Yeah. They sued him after, even though he was found not guilty, because the burden of proof, of course, is much easier right, in a civil, in a civil suit. suit. You yeah. don't have to be beyond a reasonable doubt. It just has to be over 50%. So maybe at the time she filed it, she wasn't certain that anything was going to come of the legal part of it. Well, and she was right, because it's six years later, three years since that happened, and we still have nothing. And we still don't have anything. Which is very frustrating. It is. I mean, the, the parents must be going nuts. Yeah. Now, Desiree said that in order for her lawyers to move forward with the civil suit, they would need the police file, and of course they can't have that because the police investigation is active. So there goes that. Yeah. yeah. Although you could also say that her lawyer should have told her that when Prior they filed to the this filing. suit, absolutely. Yeah. You know, saying you know you're not going to get too far in this suit unless you have the legal stuff. Right. But anyway. Yeah, I don't know why her lawyer went, let her go ahead. She filed and then withdrew it. Yeah, and maybe she'll file again. Oh, I, I mean, would, if I nothing would, happens with the criminal suit, then she might want to go ahead with that. Yes. This could go on for a long time. It certainly could. Yeah. So in 2014. Terry filed a request for a legal name change 
and that was to escape the notoriety. She said that she couldn't get a job because of the Horman name. Is that the only reason she couldn't get a job? That's what she said, because of who she was in relation to this case. I, People wouldn't just, hire her. That, that's, that's a tough one for me to think about. Yeah. I mean, so automatically, when she applies for a job and they see her last name's Horman, they think, oh, you're the person that's a person of interest, or not even a person of interest. You're the, you're the <laughs> person that might have done it. It might be a combination of her face and her name that's doing it. Yeah. I just have a tough time buying that. But anyway, she tried to change her name. She tried to change her name to Claire Stella Sullivan, and it was denied. And then four months later, she applied for a name change to Claire Kiesel, which was her mother's maiden name, I think. Now, this was interesting because on YouTube, I watched the court proceedings for this name change, and it was very lengthy. There were 3,000 signatures from the public saying that she shouldn't be allowed to change her name. And several women from the community came in and testified that they thought that she'd done something with Chiron and she shouldn't be allowed to change her name. Now, that really no, isn't... That doesn't follow. It doesn't really. I mean, whether she did or didn't, she still should be able to change her name if she desires. Well, I guess if you're trying to escape prosecution or something, you can't change your name. So if she was to change her name and then leave the country or something, there is a possibility. That yeah. she could be trying to get away with something. Okay. But yeah. they, they have her old name on record and her new name, so... Right, right. But she did... Right. She went ahead and withdrew her petition. It was just... felt She felt it was too much trouble. The judge wanted to actually interview her and ask her questions, and she didn't feel that she could do that without her lawyer. So it can't, turned into a big thing. Yeah. And so she, she, she ended there. up withdrawing it. So the people did prevent her from doing that. And there's really a lot of hatred in the community for her. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah. Then the other thing is, how often has she seen her daughter? She hasn't seen her at all since 2010. She was ordered to meet with the parental coordination director, who's someone who would work with her towards getting visitation and getting to know her daughter again. And she did attend some of those meetings, but she didn't complete a necessary parental fitness evaluation. And because that was required and she didn't complete it, she isn't able to see her daughter. Now, the thing is, with this parental fitness evaluation, she could incriminate herself. So she's right. kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place there. So she's yeah. not going to be seeing her daughter. No, I don't think so. So Terry also had this friend, Dee Dee Spicer, who told her story to People magazine. So on June 4th, when Kyron went missing... Terry's friend Dee Dee, who was a gardener, she was missing from her gardening job for one and a half to three hours that day. Now, she denies ever leaving the job during that day, but the property owners said that they couldn't find her between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., but her car was still there. Uh-huh. So what's the implication here, that she's helping her friend Terry out? I think so, yeah. Now, she first distanced herself from Terry when she was questioned. But investigators became suspicious of Dee Dee because she and Terry had a very close relationship, and Dee Dee and Terry spoke on cell phones that they purchased under a false name. So they'd gone and bought some of those disposable cell phones. Those burner phones. Yeah, because they, huh. felt, like, they felt like Terry's phone was being bugged, which it may have been. Could have been. But what did she have to hide that she needed right. to do that? Right. Now, also, witnesses had said that there was a person in the passenger seat of Terry's truck when it was parked over on the side on Skyline Drive. Wow. There were some witnesses that said that. So the white truck, there was, what do you call it when police have a talk? Press conference. Press conference. <laughs> there okay. was a press conference, and the police said that the white truck was seen on Skyline Road between 10.15 and 11.30 a.m. Dee Dee's car was at her job site, but the property owners couldn't find her. The police have photographs of Kane's truck, the one that Terry drove that day, in two locations in front of the Skyline School. They also have photos of the truck at the Fred Meyer store at 9 a.m. and the other Fred Meyer store at 10 a.m. So was it in two different places at school? Yes. It was seen parked in two different places. And so who moved it if Terry is in the science fair with Kyron? Well, 
I don't know. How'd the truck get moved? This was after, though. This a was after the fair. Yeah, when yeah. she said she left. But still. So people said they saw the car after she left, and some people have said that they saw another person. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very suspicious. I mean, you go to the science fair, you park the truck, you go in and see the fair, and you leave from the same spot. You don't park it in another spot. Sure. That makes sense. Huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, the last weekend of June, when Cain moved out of the house that he and Terry shared and took his 20-month-old daughter with him, emails between Terry and her friends questioned her lack of concern and showed some odd behavior. And this is when flyers handed out by the police, at that point they had pictures of Dee Dee Spicer and Terry and the white truck on them. Oh, both women. Both women wow. at this point, yeah. And Terry put out her own flyers. Yeah, now those were suspicious, weren't they? They, they could have been. The, the phone number on the flyers was the incorrect number. Okay. And the quotation or, or what was said on it was, last seen with an unknown man. Now, yeah. no, nobody's ever testified to that. Nobody has said that, no. So she was definitely so trying to mislead people. There's, there's some disinformation there. So maybe she thought if people saw that on the flyer, that someone would have a false memory and say, oh, I saw I saw him with a man. I saw him And that with would a take man. all the heat off of her. Right, because you know how great those eyewitnesses are. Yeah. Well, that's a good possibility, too, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Do you have anything else on that? No. Okay. All right. So she also, Terry also sent emails suggesting that Kyron was last seen with a stranger. So in addition to the flyer, there were emails that she sent out. And she also implied that Kyron had been acting oddly for the past several weeks prior to his disappearance. Now this was something that Kane had never heard her say to him. The teachers had never heard or witnessed this behavior, but she said that the way he was behaving, he could have possibly been having seizures when she'd gone into his room and he'd been staring into space or acting oddly. Now, no one besides Terry saw him doing any of that. And then later on in an interview with the, the media, Terry said that she had walked in on Kyron doing things to himself that made her think that he had been sexually abused. Like what? Well, she didn't specify. Touching himself? That's that was the implication. I mean, he's a seven-year-old boy. They the, can do that, can't the, they? The penis is the greatest toy in the world oh. at that age. I mean, oh. yeah, well, probably at any age, let's be honest. Oh, please. <laughs> at least when you're a little kid. Yeah. It's a great thing to have. Sure. <laughs> so, I don't know if, if that's even true, that she saw him touching himself, that there's... That means that he was sexually abused. It would be the, one of the last things in my mind. Right. Well, when, in the interview where she said that, she said that there were many pedophiles living in the area, and her theory was that he was abducted by a pedophile that day, which just is a stretch because he was indoors among teachers, parents who knew him, kids who knew him, and nobody saw anybody strange that day. No, nobody... it's, that's too much of a stretch. It is. But it seems like this, if she did do something to him, then the science fair was very handy for her. Yeah. I, I think that was a good alibi for her. Yeah, well, she got or, to... Or a good opportunity. Well, if we say that she did do something to him, let's just say it for a second, then this was a way for her to have herself witness taking him to school. Right. Right? Yep. And she actually had a picture of him with his project. Mm -hmm. And then she went to these stores to be seen, possibly. So she's setting up a pretty good alibi type situation here. Yeah. She, yeah. she says, we went to the fair. I let him go down to his room. Now, the other thing you could think about is, why didn't she walk him directly to his classroom? Was, was she in a big hurry to leave? Well, I don't think the fair was over when she left. Well, so what? So I mean, why did she let him just walk down the hallway? To his classroom. Why didn't she accompany him all the way to his classroom? I don't know the answer to that. That's something to think about, isn't it? I mean, yeah, to, to say we attended the science fair and then I watched him walk down the hallway towards his classroom. How much extra effort does it take to walk him down to the classroom? Well, none, but if you want to lead towards the other end, she did have a sick child with her. And if he's less than 100 feet from his classroom door and he's in the school, most people would assume he's safe. One would think so. Yes. 
but it doesn't sound like the infant was that sick because she still went to exercise and left the kid in the daycare. That's right, yeah. That's true. Hmm. So. Well, there's a lot of hate for her in the community. I'm sure there is. She's been vilified. She has. She actually moved away to Roseburg, where her parents lived, shortly after his disappearance. And then she recently moved to Sacramento, California. Yeah, that's a good idea. Get Mm -hmm. out of Oregon. Right. And if you go to the Facebook page, Tell the Truth, Terry Moulton Horman. This is a Facebook page that is all about that she's an evil stepmother. It actually says that. And it has posts all about what Terry should do, what Terry did. So there's a lot of hate for her there. Who's, who posted this? It's, some, some... it's various people in the community. I don't know who it is. Okay. But there's a group of people that are just set to follow her around, harass her until she admits what she did. Well, she hasn't yet. But she hasn't yet, no. Now, the biological parents were interviewed by Dateline, and then they were also interviewed by Dr. Phil in 2015. Oh, good. (laughs) So another thing that I hadn't mentioned was that when Terry got a lawyer after she didn't want to take polygraphs anymore, after the third polygraph when she got an attorney... So what did she get the attorney for? Well, because she didn't want to talk to police anymore. She wanted to get an attorney. Oh, okay. Because police were honing in on her, I guess. Yeah, so she hired an attorney to say, anything you got to say to her, you talk to me first. Right. Yeah, the general reason why you'd want an attorney. Yeah. But, you know, it still looks suspicious if it's your child or your stepchild that you're getting an attorney instead of saying anything and everything to try and get him found. One could say that. Absolutely. But a really strange thing was that she told a couple of friends that her attorney cost her $350,000 now. (laughs) Well, then he's not doing a very good job because she's still a big suspect. Well, she's never been named a suspect, so let's make that clear. Okay. Yeah. She's a suspect in the eyes of many people. In the public, yes, absolutely. She doesn't have a job. She got a settlement on their home, but nothing, nothing huge. So if this is true... Well, it could be true or not true. I say if it's not true, she was just being bragging or saying something, exaggerating to friends about how much this cost her. Right. That's a possibility. That's that's a strong possibility. That's the only possibility. Another thing is is that she had the money, and where did she get it? Well, where did she get it? Did she? Well, I don't know. And it wasn't money well spent. <laughs> no. Obviously. I mean, she's... Well, it's kept her out of prison. Let's look at it that way. Okay, look at it that way. Yeah. Well, what are the possibilities of what happened to Kyron? Let's just go over that now. Well, there aren't that many, right? Right. Right. How many? I mean, he was already at school at the science fair. Right. So... So you got what? Three options? I got maybe three. Okay. I'm not even sure about three. But... Possibilities. What are the the, possibilities? The possibilities are that Kyron left school on his own. And? And disappeared. Now... I don't know how nobody ever finds him if he walked out on his on his own. Well, walked out on his own and was picked up by a pedophile? Yeah. That could happen. Okay. Okay. Although most of the people that knew him said that's not something he would have done. He was kind right. of timid. He, but that's a possibility. Okay. He could have been grabbed in the school. That's possible. There were a lot of people there. But as we said, most of the people knew each other and knew Kyron, I believe. Right. And there, if he was abducted. He didn't say anything. He didn't scream. He didn't yell out any of that. Well, what if someone was to say to him, I ha- hey, Kyron, I have a red-eyed tree frog out in my car. You want to see him? Something like that. Yeah. Could have been someone who knew him, but someone who had bad intentions. Well, it's stretching it. Yeah, but it's possible. It happens. It does. Could have been someone in the neighborhood or in the area that had had their eye on him. Unlikely. Okay. But, now, and the most likely thing is that Terry, the stepmother, was involved. Okay. And you have to admit that all the evidence points to her. Yeah, but why would she do that? That doesn't make sense to me. Well, why it, would it a doesn't woman make wanna... sense to anybody. Right. Maybe she was psychotic. Yeah. Maybe she 
the psychotic because of previous steroid use. Yeah, or current steroid or use. Or current steroid use. Right. Maybe she was trying to get back at her husband. Maybe she felt like she wanted to pay more attention to her daughter, her natural daughter, rather than the stepson. I don't know. I think there's lots of reasons. Yeah. But, but there's lots of things that implicate her. There are, yeah. So well, I'm, they're, they're I'm in that camp. Well, what implicates her? I mean, we've got the polygraph. The polygraphs. So which aren't admissible in court. So how how no, accurate are they? But, but how you, meaningful are they? You have the polygraphs. Not one, but two. Three. Or three. I thought she walked out on the third one. First one she walked out on. And then took it. And then took two more. Okay. Well, right. we're, two we're or splitting three hairs here. Two or three failed She's polygraphs. She's got times that are kind of unexplained. And she's driving around in a truck. Yeah. She's got cell phone pings that put her in a place where she could have disposed of the body. Yeah, that was Savi, Savi, Savi Island. Savi Island. And that that's a place where if she did do something to Chiron and put him in the water, he could have been washed out to sea from there. Right. So that's a possibility. We've got the landscaper's testimony that she tried to hire him to kill her husband. Well, I don't know what that has to do with Chiron, though, really. Well, it just shows sh intent to kill Cain. To kill Cain. somebody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. No, I, I just think that the likely thing is that she was involved. Now, if she did that, she would have had to have done something to him before she got to the Fred Meyer store. Probably. Because he, he wasn't in the car. There's video, there's surveillance footage of the truck at the Fred Meyer store, and there was he wasn't in the car. Okay. If he was, he was unconscious or not alive. He could have been on the floor, right? Right, right. Or in the bed. Or in the bed, which would explain why she got the truck. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a possibility. And yeah. I don't know about this D.D. Spicer, be because she passed the polygraph. Yeah. So she might just so have been trying to defend her friend. She could have been. But it's suspicious that she wasn't at her job for that time period. Not that we know of. It's it's just the homeowner that says she didn't see her, right? Yeah, property. So, I don't know. Okay. The but possibility that's, that's is... also some suspicious stuff that they're buying these burner phones to communicate with each other. Yeah. And, and it's all circumstantial. But they did buy burner phones, so... Yeah. So the possibilities are that he walked out on his own, that a stranger took him, or that Terry got rid of him. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, if you'd like to learn more about the case or how to help in this case, there is a website, bringchironhome.com, that you can go to, and it has updated information on what's going on with, with the Chiron Horman case, although there hasn't been much going on the last couple of years. Nothing much. No. 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 So I would hope that they're continuing to work on it, and being able to better bolster their information to make an arrest. Yeah, hopefully. For the parents' sake, I hope that they find him. Right. And I hope that they find him alive, of course. Yeah, that's less likely, isn't it? It is, but we can hope. There's right. still hope, right? There is. Yeah. They haven't found him dead, so there's still hope that he's alive. That's true, yep. So you can listen to True Crime Brewery on iTunes, on Stitcher, or on Google Play, and you can also visit our website, tigrabber.com. You can become a member of Team Tigrabber on our website for as little as $2 a month. How does that sound? Sign me up. <laughs> I'd, even, right. I'd even do the $5 a month if I was a listener. Whoa. Because this is a pretty cool place to be. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, all. And we'll be back with another episode next week, and we might do a movie in the meantime. We had quite a few people listen to our untrue crime movie last week, so yeah. we might do that again. We might. That was sort of fun. It was. And if you have any suggestions for a movie, or if you have any suggestions for a crime, or for a beer, you can always contact us at truecrimebrewery at tigerever.com. Love to hear from you. We love to hear from people. So we'll talk to you later. That's Next week. Today. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye-bye.